everyone, and welcome back or welcome to Endurance Icons. Uh, this is the first of a two-part series where we talk to finishers of the 2023 Barkley Marathons. Uh, we're kicking it off with Aurelian Sanchez. He is the very first person to cross that finish line uh, since the uh, 2017 race. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about Barkley, his experience, uh, talking about, you know, everything from sleep deprivation to what motivated him. But we wanted to give a little bit of color um, about the Barkley marathons and Aurelian as well. Um, as you can imagine, uh, Aurelian is just off, you know, his big win. And we wanted to make sure that we're respectful of the amount of interviews that he has. So this is a bit shorter than normal. Um, but Mark and I wanted to uh, take you through some pre-information so that you know exactly what you need to know and that you can get the most out of this uh, interview. So Mark, firstly, um, Aurelian is such an incredible, incredible athlete. Yeah, it's no surprise he finished this. Like he's done some pretty epic stuff in ultra running. Like I think he's done like a 12 day crossing of the Pyrenees mountain range. Um, he has the FKT on the John Muir trail, which is just like a monster 211 mile trail, um, in the Sierra Nevada in California. So like, he's got some serious running pedigree behind him. So it's no surprise he finished this in terms of like the fitness, but man, first time for him doing this race. And he's dreamt about this for so long. Like what, what an incredible person. Like, I'm, I'm so excited to share this episode with everyone. And he does mention uh, very briefly his time on the John Muir Trail. We wanted to make sure that we took a moment to highlight all of these achievements because uh, as you're going to hear, he took so many years, I think it was six years, to make sure he was prepared. He didn't come out of nowhere. He has been doing absolutely incredible things on top of having a full-time job and uh, finding balance, which you're going to hear um, him unpack a little bit more. Um, so excited to share that story with you. Also, if you're new to the Barkley Marathons, um, we really encourage you to go to Netflix. There is a documentary film called The Barkley Marathons, The Race That Eats Its Young. And I could almost just leave it there. Um, but this is really, really a wild, wild race. Um, we, we talk a little bit about um, the philosophy behind the race. The race organizer, Laz, essentially has determined that, you know, life isn't fair. And a lot of races are uh, recognizing and handing out medals to participation medals. And that's not who he is. So he has created a, a race atmosphere where everything is, is quite unfair from the way that you get into the race uh, to the actual race course itself. Um, so there you, uh, we do not know how to get into this race. You need to first determine how to make an entry. You then have a series of very uh, complicated hoops that you need to jump through, um, skill testing questions, writing an essay. And then even um, after the hundreds of applications pour in, he only accepts 40 racers. Um, this is held in a Tennessee in Frozen Head State Park. And uh, there is five loops of this race course. And it's apparently a hundred miles, but uh, the stories that everybody tells is it's apparently about a marathon each loop. So that nets out to about 200 K and like the elevation gain on it is just insane. It looks like just the most gnarly course out there. When you arrive at the race, you need to bring a uh, license plate. And it is hung up uh, right near the yellow gate, uh, which is the start and finish line of the race. The race has started when Laz lights a cigarette and the racers are off. Um, this goes all through the day and night until uh, the uh, first uh, person crosses or people do not hit the time cap, in which case um, the race is over. Um, there has not been a finisher since 2017. Um, which makes our conversation with Aurelian so extraordinary. So please uh, buckle up, enjoy this wide ranging and very incredible conversation with Aurelian. Uh, we hope you enjoy listening as much as we enjoyed recording. Welcome to or welcome back to Endurance Icons, where we sit down with individuals who are doing some huge things in the world of endurance sports. Today, we are thrilled to be sitting down with Aurelian Sanchez. He is the, the first finisher of the Barkley Marathons since 2017. We cannot wait to dive into his story, but firstly, welcome Aurelian. Thank you so much for being on the show. 
Hi, everyone. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Jessica, for uh, welcoming here. It's such an honor. Well, firstly, like, how are you feeling? Um, this, this only, it was about a week ago that you, you finished the race um, and something like that takes such a tremendous toll on the body. So, so how's everything going? No, everything going is going very great. It's going perfect. It, uh, I was really prepared for this race and I was really lucky that uh, during this race, everything happened perfectly for me. So, um, yeah, of course, I was tired for a couple of days after the race, but uh, strangely, being in this week already, I was feeling almost recovered. Uh, so I'm feeling very good. I'm feeling uh, to go back at it, to not really drop into my uh, my shape, let's say, to keep running uh, very soon. So I'm feeling very good. Just um, the mental aspect, I was having some nightmares the last night, <laughs> feeling that I was still in my fifth loop, always and always. <laughs> um, now I'm good since yesterday, uh, but yeah, otherwise now I'm feeling good. Yeah. Wow. Um, and so, okay. For those, anyone who hasn't heard of the Barkley marathons, can you describe what the race is? Yeah. So the Barkley is, a uh, is an ultra trail. It's, uh, in nature, it's, uh, in frozen head state park, uh, it has 35 years of history and, uh, it's a trail that is unmarked. Uh, you have to, to follow a, a pre-described route, um, which is uh, where you have 13 books uh, during the route that is uh, serving as checkpoints, uh, where you tear out the page, uh, which is the same number of your beam number, and you have a, a new beam number at every loop. And basically, one loop is about 40K, about yeah, 26 miles. Uh, and 4,000 4, meters of elevation gain, that makes, I think, uh, yeah, 13,000 uh, feet of elevation gain per loop. Uh, so you have to do that five times uh, within the 60 hour limit, uh, which is uh, um, which is very tight. So that's why there is not much finishers every year because of um, the, the complexity of the physical endurance race, of the fact that you have to find your own route. Uh, I mean, you have to follow the described route, but it's unmarked. Uh, the fact that you're self-sufficient, there is no aid station during the, the race, only between the loops. So because all of that, it's complicated. Uh, and also because of the weather, the last six years, the weather was uh, not very good. And this year, it was uh, it was OK. So all of those variables together uh, make that this, the Barclay is a, is a great event of uh, endurance. So how does it feel? I mean, we talked about this in the intro, but how does it feel to be the very first person to finish this since 2017 because like you mentioned it's almost impossible to finish it they i think there's been very few finishers under 20 in the entire race history how are you feeling about that i'm feeling um amazed um i was dreaming to to at least participate at this race to be a part of it for the last six years uh, even running, only running it was a dream for me. I was really enjoying it. And, um, and of course, I was dreaming about a finish. And every year I was following along the race. I was uh, cheering on people, uh, cheering on Guillaume, who did it three times before me, uh, hoping for a finish and uh, for him and other people. And every time it didn't happen. Um, I was aware of the difficulty. Um, I was aware of the challenge that was ahead of me this year. And, um, and I did my best to prepare for it. Uh, and yeah, as you said, in the end, I was um, a finisher, uh, which was um, yeah an amazing feat for me because it was only a dream to become to to become a part of this race as a runner, and becoming a finisher was uh, beyond expected. So um, yeah, I'm very I'm very feeling grateful and um, very happy about that. And you mentioned you've been wanting to do this for six years, and I'm going to give you a bit of a prompt. So tell me about uh, the walnut shell. Yeah, so um, six years ago, I started to try running based on a lot of hiking. I did a lot of hiking and longer and longer every time. And then I was like, hey, it would be interesting maybe to, to give yourself a big goal uh, that you would prepare uh, a lot and see your limits and discover by yourself. So I found directly the Barclay. Uh, I wanted to, to be part of it and to see my limits at the Barclay and eventually fail. It, it didn't matter for me. I wanted to, to fail, but learn out of it. So, so I decided to, to do that, uh, learn how to get in and, and et cetera, and find a lot of projects. And, and one of my things I did early, uh, five years ago in 2018, I, I went to Frozen Head State Park to, to see the area and to participate to one race that Laz was holding in May as a strolling gym. So I went to the park and I saw this nutshell on, the, on top of this, of the gate. And I was like, yeah, um, 
let's take it as a symbol and as a, um, a good luck charm for the rest of the of the journey and uh, and hopefully maybe someday i will bring it back and i will close the, this big loop this big six years loop and bring it back exactly where it was uh, six years ago um, once maybe i, I finish so so I kept this nutshell always with me on every ultra I've done. Uh, I kept it with me, obviously, during the Berkeley. So this nutshell has done uh, the five loops. And then I put I put it back uh, where it was. And uh, and then I kept it. <laughs> I didn't I didn't let it in the bar because it's too much of, um, of a symbol to me. So I will look at it every time. And I will think about those six years of my life, which was uh, very important. Oh, that's such a great story, Aurelian. Thanks for sharing that. Um, you mentioned the, you know, the entry and we, one of the neat things about this race, um, and what I love about it is I think Laz, the, the race director created this race because traditionally he's saying, you know, there's a lot of, um, fairness in racing and he's like, you know, life isn't fair. So he's creating a race that is sort of a symbol of life. Um, so even, even the entry of the race is a secret, um, and we will not disclose that secret because that's sort of the lore and the wonder of the race. Um, but we also know, you know, every single time you have some skill, but based questions that you need to answer, and then you need to write an essay. And from that essay, Laz then determines, and he says that he can tell who's going to finish based on those essays. Um, are you able to tell us what your essay was about? So yeah, you said you said the, the right thing. There is different step in the application process. Uh, there is an essay, which is the first step where you need to to tell to Laz why you should be selected to the Berkeley. And uh, my message to Laz was uh, persistence, was re resilience. Uh, I told him that um, it's, it's my project in the last six years. It's not going. To, it's it's not about the Western states or the hard work or anything. There is a lot of ultra runners are, which are doing the, a lot of racing. I'm doing my ultras because of the Berkeley. Uh, that was my main project, uh, my, my red wire, we call it in French, uh, the, the wire that you follow along. And that's what I explained to Laz. I explained that I was patient, I was um, resilient. I was waiting for my turn to come, that I believed that it would come at some point, that I would be a runner of the race and I would be part of the community. I was feeling already part of the community behind, <laughs> let's say, by discussing with a lot of people and and uh, sharing the passion uh, with them. So that was my essay. I, wa I, I was telling to Laz, I want to be part officially um, of this story and uh, I'm patiently waiting for my turn and hopefully it will come someday. Wow. And so you you get in, obviously your entry, your essay worked, um, but then the training begins. And I, so you've had this shell in your pocket, you've been dreaming about it, but this is not a normal ultra. There's a lot of navigation required um, and it's very, very difficult terrain. I'd love to hear a little bit about how you prepared yourself for this because it's not simply just bringing fitness. There's mm -hmm. the mental fortitude and there also is a deep understanding of navigation. How did you prep yourself? Yeah, that's uh, a lot of hours are uh, into that. So I'm, I was re reading a lot of um, reports from people who did the race, uh, finishers and non-finishers to get into their mind, to see what they were living uh, in during that race, to see what they faced, uh, what issues they had, how they overcome um, those issues, how they become finishers, and what are the things that are making other people um, to not finish uh, this race. So being a part of the race already like this, reading a lot of reports is helping a lot, I believe. And then you, of course, as you said, um, you have to know the, the park, you have to know the route, uh, you have to, to, to spend a lot of time during um, uh, online, uh, looking at the park maps, uh, seeing the rivers, the trails, uh, everything on the park where you should locate yourself when you're lost, uh, to find an exit or to find a way to get back on course. Uh, this is a lot of hours uh, doing that. And then, of course, when we went to the park with Guillaume uh, the week before, we were training a lot on the trails. Um, the off trail is uh, not allowed, so we didn't do. But on the trail, at least, we can see the um, the, the moment where you go off trail. Uh, so that helps to to memorize and to see how you where is the route of the Berkeley. So a lot of things, online work, um, on site work, let's say, and uh, yeah. And it sounds like a lot of hours. And I think one thing that I want to point out is that you, you don't do this, like this isn't your sole job. Uh, you also are an electrical engineer. Uh, you have a relationship, you have a dog. 
how do you fit, you know, a career um, into all of the training and this incredible passionate pursuit that you've taken on? It's a um, it's a journey. It's um, bringing people with me. Unfortunately, they don't have a choice. Let's say, but I'm asking them also their approval. Uh, my my girlfriend Lucille was with me the full uh, the full journey the last three months. She she was with me. She she was bearing with me when I had to spend some weekends away to train and her uh, to have fun somewhere else. Uh, and during the weeks also when I was reading reports. Uh, so of course I spent a, lot, a long time doing that and she understood my passion and uh, where I was, um, where I wanted to go. Uh, so of course it's, uh, it's more sacrifices every day about that. And as you said, yeah, I have a job. I'm an electrical engineer. Um, so yeah, I'm working morning and afternoon uh, every day. Uh, so of course I'm training in the morning before my work, uh, midday between noon and one. And after my work, after 6 p.m., so I have to manage that. Um, eventually, it's okay. Of course, it's not optimized compared to professional uh, athletes, uh, but I was able to manage. Um, but yeah, it's a small sacrifices that I'm not willing to do all the year round. <laughs> this was a three-month um, period that I'm willing to spend again before June for another race coming up. But I'm also willing to to just have fun, let's say, even though Barclay is fun, but it's a, it's a commitment. So I'm just willing also to spend some weekends away. Like uh, today I'm going to Barcelona with my girlfriend and uh, we're going to have fun this weekend. And uh, I want to have some weekends like this also. So it's a, yeah, it's a balance. Well, I, you're due for some celebration because you said, uh, to manage, I think you did more than just manage, um, you, know, you, <laughs> you, you made sort of an, uh, an epic, uh, finish for the first time in many years. Um, so do you, uh, you, you post a lot about your dog. Um, you have an Aussie, um, does it's a, a he or a she, and do they run with you in the mountains? It, it's a, he, he, uh, he run with me in the mountains when I'm doing, Casual trainings, let's say. Uh, when I was doing, doing a lot of trainings in February, I think it was too much for him. So I didn't bring him with me because I want him to to be safe for the, his whole life. Uh, I want to yeah. also to, yeah, he doesn't have to, to do as much as I do. Uh, he doesn't train for the Barclay. So... <laughs> 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 so I keep it I keep him home sometimes but yeah I took him uh, it was now two and a half years ago uh, especially for that I want him I wanted him to share my uh, my my hiking and my training and such and uh, but yeah sometimes it's too much for him so I'm keeping keeping him home <laughs> now before we dive we're going to get to the race in just a moment but my final question is with all these train this training and you mentioned you you train before work you train for lunch and then in the evening in the, the condensed time leading up to Barkley, how many, how many kilometers were you running a week? Um, and how approximately how many hours were you training? It was about average, um, uh, yeah, 150 kilometers to 20 hours. Yeah. 20 hours training per week. Uh, peak was about 200 K and 30, 30 hours, uh, when I had a little bit more free time. I was focusing more my training on the elevation gain, uh, which was about 10,000 meter gain per week uh, at the peak and average yeah, between 7,000, 8,000 meter gain per week. Uh, that was my focus mostly, uh, working on the gain. Uh, and yeah, about 20 hours average, mostly spent in the weekends, a lot of spends uh, in, in the, on the Saturday and the Sunday because I had all my, my day, of, obviously, so I was doing... 10 to 12 hours on Saturday and uh, six to yeah five to six hours on Sunday. So as you see, it's almost 20 hours like this. And then I was doing yeah six to eight hours in the week. Uh, so that brings almost to 30 in uh, in my strongest in my uh, maximum week, let's say. And were you doing any of your training with like sleep deprivation or at night to prepare? <laughs> no, not really. Um, that would be interesting. Maybe people do. Um, on my side, I did 24 hour event in January where I, where I was not sleeping uh, all, all the 24 hours. So that was a good exercise. Um, otherwise, I'm re relying on my previous ultras, uh, my John Muir Trail, my uh, Pyrenees Crossing, everything like this where, where I faced those issues. And um, I, I kind of learned how to deal with it, even though it's not perfect and it's never perfect. Every race is, is, uh, is different. Uh, so I was relying mostly on my past experience and, um, and thankfully it was great last week. I was not really sure about how many power nap I would need. Uh, I needed only one, so it was good. So let's hop into the race a little bit here. You talked about some of those past races that you've done. Would you say 
Barkley overall was harder than those races or just different? What What's kind of the comparison between them? So it's strange. I think it was different. It's difficult to compare. I think Barclay is the ultimate challenge for me. It's bringing every parameter that you have to manage. And uh, it's such a, it's such, it has such an amazing history behind. So um, it's really the ultimate challenge. So, so yeah, uh, I, I, will not, I will not say Barclay is any easier than any other event, of course. On, on, on my experience, I was feeling very, very ready for this year, race this year. I had the race of my life and mentally, let's say, this is not the race where I, where I struggled the most um, because I had the, the goal in my mind. I was, uh, it was clear I was never going to, to give up and I was feeling very, very good for the whole race. Where I struggled a lot was on my John Muir Trail. Uh, I was not doing any trail running at this time. I had a big step to, to succeed at what I did to, to improve the FKT at this time. And I was not running at all at this time. So I failed twice at the John, John Muir and it was really too great failure. <laughs> it was amazing. I was really on the floor, lying down, not able to move. And then I had 12 hour walk back to each hike <laughs> to go back to my car. It was crazy. Uh, this was a very big struggle, um, but I don't think the John Muir Trail is bigger than the Barclay. It's just that I was not prepared enough uh, that I was this year. So it's that's why I, it's difficult to compare. Yeah. Um, jumping into um, Barclay here, like when we go through the actual race, maybe you could take us through like some of the loops and maybe some of the like really low points along the way there. And then we could jump into some of those pieces around the missing book and screaming mm. in the woods and stuff, but maybe take mm. us through like um, kind of how it was going in those first couple loops and maybe where you had some dips and, and just kind of a, a run through of the, the whole experience. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so the first two loops were good. It was uh, having fun and discovering the, the course with Guillaume together. Uh, so un uneventful, not much happened. We, we lost a couple of minutes doing some navigational mistake, but nothing big. Then I decided to move away and to move forward um, because uh, we were uh, slowing down and I was scared about the, the time limits. Uh, so this is where my, my race started. Uh, I mean, my race started, my race changed at least at the, at the end of the second loop. Then I was doing, uh, I was going back and forth with some loops, uh, with some groups in front of me, uh, sometimes with Jared Campbell and Carol Sabi, um, and uh, sometimes alone. Back with Carrel on the fourth loop. This is where I struggled the most, I think, on the fourth loop because of sleep deprivation a little bit. And uh, because of navigational mistakes with Carrer, uh, then I decided to, to again go by myself um, on the rest of the fourth loop. And then obviously there was a fifth loop, which was um, the most exhausting, let's say, because I was uh, feeling uh, tired at this time. So, but I saw the finish coming. So I was by myself for the fifth loop, for the fifth loop, but um, it was okay. I was feeling the finish um, coming soon. Um, and did you see John out there much during the event? No, John, I didn't see him at all. Um, I always was chasing him, let's say. I was uh, behind his footsteps. So I saw him at the break between loop four and loop five, mm -hmm. uh, where we had actually kind of a transition. He was uh, he wanted for clockwise, and I wanted also for clockwise. So we had a little bit of a race going on <laughs> for for just one or two minutes. Uh, then he was ready before me, so, so he started the, the fifth loop. And uh, no, otherwise, I didn't see much. We, we, we crossed each other sometimes on the, when the, we were changing direction. Uh, I saw him at this transition, and that's it. Uh, we never ran together. I ran mostly with Carrer a little bit, um, with Damian Hall a bit, with uh, Jared Campbell, uh, with other people back in the... In the um, yeah, in the pack uh, who, who gave up before, but uh, yeah, John, uh, not, not much. And it, it was, I read reports that it was very, very cold. How did you manage that? Is that something that you do well with? Yeah, it was freezing. Uh, the first night was difficult. I was not able to manage it properly. I still have my lips uh, recovering of it. So it was not easy, but uh, yeah, the, the cold is okay. It's um, when it's raining, when it's foggy, this is uh, difficult to, to navigate. Uh, so this was not part of the game this year. So I was really feeling lucky to, to not have that. So the cold, yeah, we, it was very cold at night, but we were bringing some more clothes and uh, it was eventually okay. 
So talk about this uh, this missing book on Loop 5, because I can imagine at this point you're very tired and maybe you're looking for this book and questioning like, I think it should be here, but maybe you're also doubting yourself at this moment. Run us through kind of what you were thinking at that point and like, did you look for a long time or did you just know that it was missing for sure? What did that look like? Yeah, no, that was frustrating. I knew, I knew it was there. Uh, it's a, it's a cairn. It's a big pile of rock. Um, I removed all the, all the rocks, and it was not there. So I was, I was surprised. I was, I didn't know what to do. I was looking around. I was not seeing another pile of rock. I was pretty sure it was here. Um, so yeah, I was looking around. I was like, I wanted to take a picture of the rock to tell, okay, I'm here, but uh, I didn't have a phone, obviously. Um, then I took um, a, a leaf that was on the floor from a tree, a leaf. To, so like this last will count 13 things out, out of my uh, <laughs> of my ziplock, but it's, it didn't make sense. I could have picked up this leaf anywhere. Uh, I didn't know, know really what to do. I was frustrated. So um, I, I, I put the rock on the floor. They were not in form of a pyramid anymore, in form of a cairn. So I was I was thinking if Laz is, uh, is concerned, I, I was going to tell him you should um, ask someone to go check that the rocks are all on the floor now. So, um, so I was there. Uh, I was going to tell him that. So I was relieved. I had my, my story, let's say. Uh, I was feeling okay myself. I knew I was following the course. I knew I was going to, to do it. It was a dream for six years. As I told you, I was not even sure myself I was going to finish. And I had my self-recognition, let's say. So this book was for uh, external recognition, which was coming second to me. So um, it was frustrating. Uh, I didn't know what Laz would say when he was counting the page, the pages. Uh, but I was feeling, okay, this is why I lost about five minutes at the book and I started to move again. So, it, and I love this point because you were saying that everything went perfectly or this was like the race of your life. Everything uh, was in place. It was inter interesting to see that even when you have a race where everything goes so smoothly and you were ready physically and mentally that there still are some things outside of your control that can go wrong. Um, did you have any moment where you needed to sort of readjust your mindset and get back into that race mentality? Did this throw you at all or how did you manage through that? Yeah, it was mostly okay. Uh, I was analyzing what I was doing wrong and what could I improve during the race one decision I made was to leave Carrer on the first loop because I was not, he was not helping me and I was really not helping him. He was a veteran. He knew the, he knew the course. I was not a veteran. I, I, I didn't know the course. So I was, uh, I was making a lot of navigational mistakes um, because I was uh, rushing, because I was thinking Carrer would help me. But Carrer was sleep deprived on the first loop and he was also counting on me and uh, following me, just trying to shut down the brain and... Uh, it was a good relief for him, but we met, we were making some navigational mistakes that we should not have have made. Um, so at this time, I was analyzing analyzing that, and I was thinking. Uh, usually, you think in a team you're stronger, you're you're stronger within the nights to be with people. At this time, I realized um, it's not the case anymore. We should really be back to hundred percent focus. Uh, everyone, myself, focus on myself, and career focus on himself. That's why I decided to leave forward um, and to, to, to go with the front group and to move away also, because that helps to focus myself and to not think uh, unconsciously that Carver would fix my uh, navigational uh, error. So, so that's one thing I've done, yeah. So did you have any uh, like hallucinations or um, like sleep deprivation issues yourself? And how did you deal with them if you did? I had a little bit this time, not much, uh, to be honest. I had bigger on John Muir or other previous project. This time I just had, uh, you know, when you're, in, when you're in the forest for for the night, you, you don't hear anything but the trees and the winds and the leaves and the, the nature, you know, which is um, a very small noise, a background noise, let's say, uh, that my brain was uh, identifying like there were voice 100 meters away, uh, but not clear voice, you know, like there is some random hiker discussing with someone else 100 meters away. So it's not, it was not really clear. Um, and those voice, uh, there, there were, there were Guillaume voice in my head uh, with, uh, yeah, like he was talking to me 100 meters away, asking where we were going, but it was really small voice, just the brain associating some background noise to some familiar noise. That was just about that, which was very light, I would say. Nice. So not too bad. Um, so a, a big, 
a huge race like this, that's like 60 hours long, clearly you're burning like a crazy amount of calories and mm -hmm. um, fueling is a huge part of this. What were some of your like go-tos in terms of uh, what did you eat kind of during the day that allowed you to continue to go all yeah. the way for 60 hours? <laughs> I was eating a little bit of everything. Uh, the, the thing I ate the most and I'm uh, sharing is about cheeseburgers. That's what I uh, was the most caloric uh, food I was eating. And it was really great with proteins and calories. So it was great. But otherwise, I was eating a lot of anything, uh, cheese, sweets, candies, um, uh, chocolate, uh, um, sweets. Yeah, anything that was uh, with protein and with a lot of calories. Uh, and then at the camp, I was eating fruit, cookie dough, um, anything that I, I had. Yeah, um, many, many things very caloric. Yeah, you're making us hungry. Uh, is there anything <laughs> that you were craving afterward? Like what what was something that you ate after the race to recover? We went to a pizzeria um, in uh, Oak Ridge uh, with John, with John Kelly, John Figueverezi, Damien Hall. Uh, the full team. It was uh, it was very nice. Um, and then we went to Outback Steakhouse to have some uh, <laughs> some nice steak as well. I, I really enjoy the the steakhouse in the US, so it was very fun as well. Uh, so yeah, things like this. And then I was moving back to home. So one of the questions we got, um, we had put out to some of our uh, our viewers that we were talking to a, a Barkley finisher and they asked a question um do you read so the pages that you took from the book did you do you first do you keep all those pages after and do you read any of them <laughs> yeah or no i'm not throwing them away there they will be with me together uh it will be uh those are my medals let's say we don't have yeah. any medals at the barclay and that's fine but those are my uh Every single page is um is uh yeah it's very important for me so um, I didn't read those. <laughs> I didn't. Uh, I, I mean, I'm thinking about buying those books. There are certain books to buy them and to put them on my shelf. Uh, maybe I will do that. Uh, and maybe that will be the opportunity to read, but uh, I didn't do it yet. You need a little trophy case for that walnut shell and you got a little Barkley shrine going for your incredible <laughs> win. Um, yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah. We talked a little bit about at the beginning of that, that Laz has worked really hard to create a truly almost impossible race. Um, and, and the magic of this race is that it's so difficult that it really is like you had mentioned, you're not even sure if you're going to be able to finish. And the premise is it that, you know, it's maybe not a fair race. Um, I know that when that book was missing, they identified it was missing and Laz said, no, this is the, this is the, um, this is the way the race works. Uh, we're not going to put it back out on the course. And it's, what is that problem solving? How do you work through challenges? And uh, he's he's used the phrase, how can racers find greatness within themselves? So um, knowing that there's a lot of athletes that return year after year after year to try and get and achieve what you just achieved, I'd love to hear a little bit of what does it mean to you right now to have finished Barkley? Uh, it means a lot. Uh, as you said, I think Laz made the right choice. I think uh, this is all about the Berkeley. Uh, it's not about helping the runners to achieve what they should do. Um, I think putting back the book would, be, would have been a help. It was the situation as it was. I think we should have hid the book better. Maybe the hiker would not have uh, taken the book if it was hidden in the, um, in the rock pile. So that, that's it's like this. It's a Berkeley. I, I kind of agree with Laz, but I also feel my uh, my friends, uh, Lucille, who was um, concerned away, Guillaume, which was in camp with Pauline and Alexandre, they were, they were scared. Um, they, they had time to pull it back and they were expecting, OK, what, what will he do? Will he lose his race because of this book? So, so it was concerning for him, for, for them. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I think I agree with this uh, mindset. I think the Berkeley is all about the runner being by himself and just managing the, whatever he has to face. And, uh, and yeah, in the end, I'm very proud and very happy about the scenario. It's such a, um, an achievement of, of a lifetime for me. I lived uh, the, the race of a lifetime. I, I had such an amazing moment. It's not like sometimes in some racing, you're feeling a low moment for 10 or 15 hours and all you are looking for is a finish and move to another project and really forget about this one almost like. Um, I, I would like to go back at some point at the Barclay. I had very great memories and uh, I'm very feeling uh, privileged about that. 
Do you have any favorite moments from the race outside of, you know, finishing and realizing that you're this first finisher since 2017, but is there any highlights to you? We talked a little bit about low moments, but what were your favorite moments of the race? My favorite mo moment was uh, the finish when I was sharing that with, uh, with Guillaume, with Pauline, with Alexandre. So, so much emotion. It's uh, not only about me. It's only about the people who were here, uh, my friends and uh, Lucille and my family and my friends who were away. They were not in the park, but as soon as I finished one hour away, when I had network, I was contacting her. I was contacting them, sharing that with them. So definitely my favorite moment was, uh, was the finish and the, and the sharing after that. Amazing. And we know, we know that you uh, have, we could talk forever about all your other accomplishments and that might have to be another time in a different podcast. Um, but you know, you, you have accomplished a great deal. Um, you know, you said this is one of your achievements of a lifetime, but you really have achieved so much um, in the, in the races leading up to this point. Um, I'd love to also hear, is there any, what's next for you? What are you wanting to do next? Uh, take some time off, enjoy my, my girlfriend, my family, my friends. <laughs> it's not only about me and my, uh, and my project. I, I think it should not be the case. Um, but uh, yeah, also as project wise, of course, I have one more project in the year, which in June, uh, it's called the Chartreuse Terminal Room. It's a, the French Barclay, let's say. It's been six years, it has been created and nobody finished. So it would be very interesting to see if it can be finished or, or not. So where is the limit, if it's over limit or not. So I'm very attracted by those kind of events. Uh, this is coming in June, uh, but as I said, uh, this is not only about that. After June, I will also just take some... Uh, some time off, let's say, no project, just having fun in the mountains and with my uh, my girlfriend and my uh, my friends and and things and and yeah, I want to find my balance. That's uh, my my main project to to have a, a life with a good balance. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I I love that. I think if anyone can achieve that race, you can based on your your uh, just the performance you just put out. Um, <laughs> I'd you. like to know, does anything scare you? Uh, I'm, I have the fear of height. Uh, when I'm uh, on a tower, I'm very scared. <laughs> so like severe mountaineering might not be in your immediate future. <laughs> yeah, kind of. Uh, it depends. I think it's man-made man buildings that are scaring me or very when you have, um, I don't know, when you see a lot of heights uh, under your, uh, your feet, I'm very scared. So yeah, alpinism depends. Depends what. <laughs> well, and the reason so rising um uh, makes me think of uh so you have a quote um on your social media called rise like a phoenix from the ashes and i'd love to know what's the personal meaning of that for you for me so there is a word phoenix that i like because i was living in the city of phoenix for four years so that's something already nice but uh, the, the meaning behind is I don't mind burning my uh, myself. I don't mind burning like a phoenix, burning my uh, my wings. Uh, I really don't mind going over the limits. I really don't mind putting me into big projects where I will fail, where I will burn my wings, where I will die, let's say, almost. Uh, uh, I mean, not die, uh, <laughs> obviously, but you know what I mean, uh, the mm -hmm. figure. Uh, and then from that, uh, born, re being reborn again from uh, my ashes, from uh, my failures, learn all of it. Uh, to become stronger, uh, like the phoenix is becoming stronger from uh, his ashes. And I really like this image. Don't be scared about burning your wings. Uh, burn your wings and try to become stronger from that. And you will uh, eventually become stronger. Uh, I really like that. Well, I can't think of a better sentiment to end our conversation with. Um, so thank you so much. We've invited you on the show because you're our endurance icon. I'd love to know who's your endurance icon. Ah, I have a lot. Uh, so the Barclay, all the finishers, I don't have only one. Uh, all the previous Barclay finishers I have. I have all adventurers. Uh, I have all ultra trailers, uh, Francois Daen, uh, John Kelly. Uh, I have a lot. I could not name only one. So I'm, uh, I'm having a lot of inspiration from a lot of endurance athletes. Uh, and I think this is where uh, this is getting interesting. This is about the sharing and the inspiration between everyone. Oh, I completely agree. And it's so great to be surrounded by so many icons. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, for all of our listeners who want to follow you and all of your wonderful adventures coming up, uh, where's the best place for them to do that? 
I'm sharing most of my things on Instagram, um, Aurelian underscore Sanchez underscore. So um, I'm happy to, to share that here. Uh, so yeah, uh, I will share my future project on there. And, um, and yeah. Well, Aurelian, uh, thank you so, so much for coming on the show. It was so great to catch up it's, and live vicariously through your epic Barkley Marathon's experience. Uh, we hope recovery keeps going well and uh, look forward to watching all the things you're going to do this year. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. It was very nice to, to discuss with you. I really appreciate the, the support and the interest. So thank you again. It was, uh, it was very fun. Wow. How great was that? I always learned so much from these endurance icons. If you enjoyed the podcast as well, please consider liking us across social media, subscribing to us on YouTube, or giving us a five-star rating on wherever you listen to your podcasts. We appreciate you and your support so much. We wish you happy training and we'll see you back next week.